We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. Perfect. So we start our session. I, as I said, we have interpretation from English to French and vice versa. And I believe it is working now. Uh, we are online, most of us. We only have one panelist in the room. And uh, as uh, I shall be introducing, you will know who is uh, connecting from where. Is my sound now working? Uh, Margaret, I think uh, the interpreters uh, for French, Belen, complains that he can't hear you. Uh, but I'm, I think he should actually probably also be selecting the other channel to be able to hear you. Because if he doesn't select the channel, he can't hear you. So we still don't have the understand the interpretation in French. Though I still see Esther Milenge is still not assigned. Esther Milenge is supposed to be assigned as an interpreter. Okay, I'm not sure whether I am communicating to, to the host. Okay, I have been made an interpreter. I should not be the interpreter. It is Esther Milenge. I'm going to paste the name in there. Well, Esther, can you write a message to the general WhatsApp group? I think you're not an interpreter anymore, so it should probably work. Yeah, it is working now. So thank you very much. My name is Margaret Nyambura Ndongo, a senior internet governance expert uh, working on the policy and regulation initiative for digital Africa. For those who may be new to this, uh, PRIDA is a joint in initiative of the African Union, the European Union, and the International Telecommunication Union. In this workshop, we ask ourselves, could cyber diplomacy be the bridge to Africa's digital transformation? Just to give you a bit of context, the African Union launched the digital transformation strategy in February last year, that is uh, 2020. And the strategy lands from 2020 to 2030. For effective implementation of this strategy and to achieve the desired outcomes, there is a need to build trust, boost confidence, and ensure we have reliable and secure infrastructure across the continent. In 2014, the African Union Commission adopted the Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. The Malabo Convention provide, um, provide fundamental principles and guidelines to ensure an effective protection of personal data and create a safe digital environment for the security of citizens and privacy of individuals' online data. To date, only less than 15 countries have ratified this convention. And we ask ourselves, uh, cyber diplomacy works by building strategic partnerships across social, economic, and cultural dimensions of development. It cuts across. So could this be what we are lacking as a continent? Should we be focusing on cyber diplomacy to position ourselves where we need to do that? To discuss these important issues, we have five distinguished panelists and our appreciation to the panelists for being ready to share their expertise with us. With me moderating the session is Mr. Adil Suleiman, the Senior Policy Officer, African Union Commission. We also have a rapporteur, Madam Harimeno uh, from Madagascar IGF. Without much ado, I introduce our panelists without any particular order. And uh, our panelists, if we could uh, put our cameras on, that would be very good. Uh, we have Mr. Abdul Hakim Ajijora, the chair of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group and a former commissioner, Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace. We also have Mokta Yedali. Uh, I hope Mokta is 
already here with us, the African Program Director for the Global Forum on Cyber Expert, that is DFCA. We have Dr. Nena Ajufo, the Vice Chair of the African Cyber Security Expert Group and Senior Lecturer, Law and Technology at Swanea University, United Kingdom. We also have Vladimir Radunovic, the Director of Cyber Security and E-Diplomacy at the Diplo Foundation. And finally, we have Mr. Piz Odinon, the Director of Future Networks at DG Connect European Commission. A detailed bio with, uh, will be pasted in the chat so that we are able to understand who our panelists are. Uh, in the venue physically attending, we have uh, Mr. Piz and the rest of us are connecting online. So a warm welcome to all of you, and we are looking forward to an interactive discussion. We will spend the next 40 minutes addressing our prepared questions that we'll be asking our panelists, after which the floor will be opened for 35 minutes that will be moderated by Adil uh, to understand what are the views that could be coming from the floor. And without uh, wasting any more time or spending any more time, I start my first question, which is addressed uh, to Mr. Abdul Hakim. Uh, Mr. Abdul, I just want to make sure you are connected. Uh, can you kindly put on your camera if you are here with us? Um, and, and Nayabura, uh, let me just give you an update. Uh, he's talking to me now. Uh, he's trying to connect. He's uh, facing some issues with the connection. So maybe you can go to the next uh, panelist. Thank you, Adil. I will go to our second panelist. And uh, this question is addressed to Dr. Nena. And probably to go back to you, Adil, kindly also get in touch with uh, Mokta. I see he is not also connected. So I go to you, Dr. Nena, and uh, we are discussing issues of cybersecurity. So could cyber diplomacy be the key to unlock the ratification of Malabo Convention? Are we ready for regulation of digital space through international law and cooperation? To you, Dr. Nina. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for the invitation to join this panel um, of IGF to discuss a very important issue, of course, in relation to the African continent. Now, um, to address the question, um, I would say, of course, undeniably, and it's very evident that Africa is somewhat more disadvantaged in terms of cyber diplomacy. When you begin to discuss cyber diplomacy and, you know, looking at what is happening at the diplomatic level in relation to cyber governance, digital governance, cyber security. And it has been obvious that there are also political dimensions to, Africans, uh, to Africa's agenda on cyber governance, and I would explain. Now, since the adoption of the Malabo Convention in 2014, which you talked about, Margaret, the AUC has been organizing cybersecurity capacity building workshops. The AUC has been engaged in efforts to push for the ratification of the Malabo Convention. The AUC has been promoting cybersecurity culture, building trust and confidence in the use of ICT, including you know, making efforts to strengthen the cyber capacities of, cyber capacities of member states and not just stopping at the Malabo Convention, it's worthy to mention that in 2018, you know, the Executive Council of the African Union also endorsed the AU Declaration on Internet Governance and Development of the Digital Economy and adopted cybersecurity as a flagship project of the African Union Agenda 2063. Now you also have the PREDA project showing efforts, you know, to push for unification in terms of cybersecurity policy, agenda, and strategy. Yet the Malabo Convention is yet to receive adequate ratification needed for it to come into force. Now, when you sit back and think about issues like this, then you begin to underscore, you know, for yourself that, you know, there are political dimensions you know, in relation to the failure or refusal to ratify the Malabo Convention. And you must remember that African states are also rooted in their respective historical, cultural, and political context, which impact their ideologies, mandates, and capacities, you know, to bear the implications for dialogues and negotiations for cybersecurity measures. So that is why examining 
When you examine the political strategies for cyber governance in Africa, it is important to consider how political strategies such as cyber diplomacy can be leveraged to strengthen cyber governance in Africa. Now, cyber diplomacy as a strategy encourages states towards building strategic partnerships, enhancing cooperation and engaging multilaterally. And in terms of Africa, cooperation and diplomacy would increasingly be a prerequisite to realization of cyber, cyber stability, not just for the Malabo Convention. So I agree, cyber diplomacy can be a much needed strategy to push for the ratification of the Malabo Convention. You know, cyber activities go beyond national borders and Africa must ensure cooperation through encouraging the development of compatible and harmonized cybersecurity laws and the ratification of the Malabo Convention is a huge step to create a uniform system of cyber governance. Now, on whether African states are ready for regulation of the digital space through international law and cooperation, I will just be brief. International law principles do apply in cyberspace. That is a general rule. And it has been re-emphasized by the UNGGE, you know, by the OEWG and um, and all and all forums, you know, it's accepted that international law principles do apply in cyberspace space, and states, whether European, African, or Asian, are primary subjects of international law and must abide by principles of international law when they relate to cyberspace and digital issues. However, for the African region, it is important to bear in mind that, you know, the significance and influence of any international or regional agreement, convention, or treaty in any country is only viable to the extent to which the instrument has been domesticated and implemented into national law and strategies. And when we talk about cyber governance, many times international standards will always collide with the realities of developing states, particularly for states in African region, where we are at the end of the digital divide still, we lack the capacity, skills, and infrastructure to effectively ensure digital or cyber governance at international standards. So even though we know that you know, we must abide by international law in relation to cyberspace, in reality, sometimes our, our reality, our digital capacity makes it impossible for regions like Africa to compete internationally in participating in international and global cyber governance discourses. We have so many issues to tackle. Infrastructure is certainly one of them. Not only is Africa the least digitalized region, but it also doesn't have sometimes the minimum infrastructure to ensure cyber resilience. So sometimes it makes nonsense of the international dimensions of cyber governance or the reality of international law being applied to cyberspace. However, that will not trivialize the necessity of international cooperation as enhancing cyber governance must be a collaborative effort. And indeed, I agree that state actors in African states need to devise you know, international cooperative mechanisms such as cyber diplomacy to implement um, international norms and rules of cyberspace um, locally in the continent as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Nina. Very insightful. And uh, with that, I come to Blada. And Vlada, how can the African state prepare for cyber diplomacy, uh, participate and follow the UN processes? I know Nena mentioned the processes. And how do we ultimately implement the outcome of these processes? Over to you, Vlada. Thank you, Nambura. And again, thanks for, for the kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to discuss the Africa, to be in Africa, even if virtually. And those that know me know that uh, this setting behind me, the African painting, is a regular one. It's not for this, for this occasion only. Um, I'll probably save the second part of your question implementation for a later discussion, but I want to focus now on preparing Africa and, and not just Africa, developing countries for cyber diplomacy. And I used to joke with that there are two types of people uh, when it comes to cyber diplomacy, those that would ask cyber what, and those that would ask what, what cyber? And then there is a couple of us that know what cyber diplomacy is and we believe that everyone else knows that, but we are really, really a minority. So the first step in that is how do we ensure a buy-in from decision makers? Because they don't have a clue what cyber diplomacy is. They don't even care. If you look at um, you know, whether cyber, cyber issues, cybersecurity in particular, which, which is, is maybe in focus, uh, can cybersecurity win the elections? In US, yes. But in Africa, definitely not. That's not the topic on the agenda. It's the same thing in Balkans, many, many other places. It's just not the political, yet the political topic. 
But there, and Malibu Convention that you mentioned is an example of that hard buy-in because people are not, policymakers are still not tuned to that. Now, the good thing is that cyber, cyber diplomacy coverage is broad. And we usually talk about security context, which is sort of a focus of cyber diplomacy, but it's not just that. Cyber diplomacy, if you ask experienced diplomats in, in ministries that, that, that have a position of cyber ambassador or uh, some sort of uh, small offices, they would tell you that they equally have to follow discussions or at least what's happening in the World Trade Organizations when it comes to e-commerce negotiation. It touches upon cybersecurity, but also e-commerce, the trade and so on. Even sustainable development goals, but there, because there is a, a, a huge connection between digital and even security and sustainable development goals. For instance, from, from the course that we had in Diplo recently, there was an interesting twist talking about cybersecurity as an enabler of development, as an enabler of commerce, trades, rights, not as talking about cybersecurity. And probably in many countries and including Africa, these other things are more relevant politically and they win the elections other than security and other than cyber particularly. So there is a need to connect, to reframe this discussion when we provide buy-in or try to get the buy-in to connect with financial inclusion. I mean, back to Mpesa and the other innovations that we always mention, but that's what concerns people. And that's what concerns the politicians over there. So the first step is ensuring this sort of a buy-in by decision makers by connecting to real problems. And Prida work on, on IG was quite a useful background in that sense. I think we, we worked a lot on connecting the dots and explaining how this fits into the African context. So that's the first bit. The second bit is the resources to deal with it. And again, it's not just the African problem. Take a look at who's dealing with open-ended working group in New York out of the African missions in New York. I mean, African missions in New York and Geneva and many other developing countries are a couple of people only. And a single person is dealing with everything from cyber to, uh, I don't know, environment to uh, science to migrations, whatever, right? Um, we have very few resources. There are lack of capacities and very few diplomats. And if, even if you observe participation of African countries in cyber diplomacy processes in the UN, and we have a lot of statistics in Diplo, I'll be happy to share details of, of African participation. But for instance, there were a total of eight African countries that have participated in six group of governmental experts uh, groups with about total 100 positions. So eight out of more or less 100, right? Uh, in the first open-ended working group, we had 16 African countries participated. It's really not much out of maybe 90 countries that were more or less around there, uh, and sometimes even more. Uh, and it's interesting to note that among these 16 countries, 11 countries haven't participated in the GG. That means you had some newcomers, but it also means that countries that participated in GG, some of them did not participate in the open-ended working group, which means even those people that are in New York or Geneva, they, they shift, they change. It's not, there is no continuity. Um, only two African countries participated in the setup of the new Open Ended Working Group in the organizational meeting in Germany, right? We'll see what happens next week in New York for the first substantial session. I hope um, numbers will be much higher. But then we have 47 countries participated in the organizational session of the Cybercrime Ad Hoc Committee, 47 African countries. So you see the, the difference in, in interests and the framing of what actually interests African decision makers. Crime obviously interests them more than, you know, this vague cyber norms and all that. Uh, so that's one question. The other question is who's supporting the capitals? So we have a lack of coordination between relevant ministries and lack of appointed authorities on a national level, again, not just in Africa, between ICT ministries, ministries of foreign affairs, which are usually very weak in this context, some regulatory authorities and so on. So what can we do? On one hand, in the capital, we firstly need to find a way after this buying to clearly recognize digital as a foreign policy topic. And that's missing, that's missing in many countries. Then appointing a person, whether it's level of ambassador or lower, usually ambassador because he or she has resources and, and commitment with a small team and some resources to start digging into that. Developing national digital foreign policy strategy, uh, train the team, map the people that we have around, uh, processes and do some sort of prioritization. And of course, afterwards, harmonize 
this uh, across the African continent. When it comes to diplomacy, how do we enhance hands-on resources? One important thing is cyber diplomacy is not just for diplomats. And it might be shocking for many diplomats because diplomacy is, you know, this sort of a specific area with privilege. There's a lot of learning, training, participation. It's not anymore. Things in cyber happen out of UN to a large extent as well. They happen at the IGF, even if just policy shaping. They happen in the uh, standardization development organizations where African countries, apart from the ITU, are not that present. Maybe an ISO a little bit, but to what extent African and generally states are present in IEEE, in ITF, it's just a techie community, but things happen there. Um, in ICON, in Paris Corps, in the GFC, you have nominally representation, but they're not always necessarily as active as other stakeholders from Africa, which are true Africans as well. And you have, and we developing countries have a, a leverage, we have a great potential in these people, which, is, which are not officials, but we heavily underuse that. We focus on officials. We don't map people that we have over there. We have, I mean, you had people in various high positions in, in various fora. We never use them. So get them on board. At the same time, let's train the diplomats in missions. Get them the, to the online training there. Now in COVID times, there are a lot of online trainings, self-paced, guided. You have another UNODA training, uh, OSC training on, on confidence that building matters. The GFC is working on knowledge models. Diplo conducts regular online courses. So. We need them, we'll do, by the way, another round of training of diplomats in spring in New York, and we regularly do in Geneva. So get us your contacts if you wish to, to get more diplomats involved. Uh, and maybe lastly, just what, what Diplo can offer to that as, as a, um, a reminder. So we uh, hope to publish this African digital foreign policy paper by the end of this year, at least the first draft. So that will be an interesting point for further discussion on how to develop uh, digital foreign policies in, uh, throughout Africa. We're working together with the GFC on these knowledge models. One of those will be for Africa. One of those will be on cyber diplomacy. Uh, we have regular online cybersecurity diplomacy courses. I think the next one will run again in February or March uh, and other digital policy courses. And as I said, we will be doing training for diplomats in Geneva, New York, and maybe hopefully also others in other places. And I'll stop there and we can get back to implementation at the later stage. Margaret, back to you. Thank you, Vlada. Very, very informative. Uh, our panelist, uh, Hakim, has joined us. So I'll go back to Hakim before we go to peace. So Hakim, welcome. Thank and you. I'll ask you, uh, why is cyber diplomacy important for the continent? And uh, as you answer that, tell us, are there opportunities? And should we be interested with issues related to cyber diplomacy? Welcome, Hakim. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, I'm, I must sincerely ap ap apologize. Uh, I had some connectivity issues. Uh, that's why I'm uh, uh, unfortunately a bit late. Uh, but let's build on uh, what uh, Vladimir has said. I think part of our challenge uh, across the continent is that we've not done a good enough job in enlightening our leaders on in terms of uh, what are the benefits and what are the opportunities of cybersecurity very broadly and cyber, cyber diplomacy uh, very specifically. Um, for those of us who studied history, we may recollect that in 1884 to 1885, uh, there was something called the Berlin Conference. And this conference led to the partitioning of Africa, uh, which is why tribes, for example, are split across borders. Uh, that is why sometimes seemingly incompatible groups find them within a particular jurisdiction or nation. And none of us, none of our ancestors were actually at the table when uh, these discussions and, and, and these uh, borders and edges were being set. We now see the development of norms, uh, which are arguably soft laws, and I'll speak to that in a moment, but these norms are being created and they will impact us over the long term. And we need to be meaningfully at the table to engage as empowered peers and partners, not simply as junior partners, but as empowered peers. So on the issue of norms, basically norms are soft laws. And again, as history has shown us in the areas of space, nuclear, even laws of the sea or laws of the ocean, 
uh, often these norms or soft laws can evolve into hard international law, which all nations must obey at the cost or peril of being a global pariah state. And so again, Africa and Africans must be at the table as peers because Africans like others must live in the future with the precedent set and the decisions uh, made today. So when we look at protecting the digital African, uh, we can really only achieve this by positively empowering and protecting all people uh, around the world, not just our own people. And because cyber, like other global environments, is only as strong as the weakest link, it is imperative that Africa not be that weak link. And again, to build on the, the, the notions of value proposition that uh, Vladimir had alluded to, uh, it is uh, projected that in the next um, 10 years or so, and this is uh, something by William McCanty of Siriano, uh, they are projecting that the cybersecurity solutions market uh, will be across Africa, will be anywhere between uh, 10 and $15 billion US. And so we do need to get our leaders to begin to think in terms of what percentage of that action will be for your country? Um, what wealth can your country generate from that market? What job opportunities can be generated from that market? And indeed, as a byproduct, what taxes can your government generate from the wealth and the jobs generated by that market? And I think if we begin to get our leaders to see that actually there are very direct benefits because obviously, um, you know, a, a, a well-empowered, uh, a, a, a prosperous populace would tend to be interested in voting, you know, for the political class or the, the politician that actually has helped uh, steer that country towards that wealth uh, and towards that prosperity. Uh, also, we, we have to appreciate that our young people would be the primary beneficiaries in terms of the, that uh, empowerment and employment. But we do have to make sure that Africa and Africans are actually part of the solution and no longer simply uh, perceived as part of the problem. And finally, uh, ISC Square did a survey in 2020 and they, they project that there is um, a global vacancy in the cybersecurity sphere of 3.12 million persons. So obviously, <clears throat> In Africa, we have to overproduce the capacity required to begin to fill some of those vacancies. Today, we have young Africans dying crossing the desert. They die crossing the Mediterranean. But if these, um, uh, and then even when they get to Europe or to North America or wherever it is um, they end up, they become almost like a permanent underclass. Now, if we're able to over empower them and overproduce, some of these people will actually be flown into the diaspora. But more importantly, they, they can work from home and generate the kind of foreign revenues that many of our countries are, are desperately seeking. So I think it is imperative that we get our political class, our ultra high strategic leadership to understand and appreciate that cyber security, cyberspace itself presents a lot of opportunities but that we do have to make sure that we also address the, 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 the rules, the, the, the norms, uh, those things that can be looked at in terms of interactions or state behavior among themselves within the cyber realm. And this is where it's critically important that in Africa and each of our nations develops a generation of cyber diplomats who will be sufficiently informed <clears throat> and empowered <clears throat> to be able to sit as engaged uh, peers and sit meaningfully at the table with other nations to be able to hammer out some of these very, very long-term and foundational agreements. Uh, I'll leave it for here for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hakim. Uh, as you rightfully said, you, you, we are as weak as our weakest point. And uh, when we come to cybersecurity, that's an area we really need to look into. And I come uh, to Mr. Pierce. 
And uh, to you, Peace, uh, again, welcome. You are the only one who is at the venue and uh, we can now see what is happening over there. And th this question is to you. In the 2020 European, uh, in the 2020 European Union cybersecurity strategy, there are a series of actions related to global internet security. How could African stakeholders be involved in the overall effort to increase internet security? You do not want to remain the weakest point. So over to you, Mr. Peace. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, thank you so much for inviting uh, me to speak on behalf of the European Union. Uh, and I'm very glad that uh, I get to speak after the other very insightful uh, contributions that have been made because it helps to frame what I would like to say in response to your question and the discussion. Because yes, indeed, the European Union has been quite active in setting out its own strategy uh, and regulatory policy for improving cybersecurity and uh, arming ourselves with the necessary measures to ensure a high level of cybersecurity across the internet space in the European Union. But the internet is a global and we hope unified ecosystem and we hope that it will remain to be so. And that is why it is so important that we do not think of this uh, only as a regional issue because we do not want the internet to be fragmented. And just as it is the case that it is very important to recognize the weakest link element that you have just referred to and which Hakim referred to, it is also the case without being too naive about it, that as a decentralized and a distributed network, the internet is as such quite resilient. Uh, so there are no single points of failure, but as I, we hope the internet uptake use availability in Africa develops, of course, it is acceptable to nobody that we simply say, well, as long as the core, which is managed elsewhere, is secure, we don't have to worry too much about the security of those decentralized parts, the, the, the part of the internet that is distributed in Africa or anywhere else for that matter. And so that is why the governments, but also the multi-stakeholder community from Africa must be allowed to be fully engaged as equal uh, partners um, for any issues addressing global internet security and also to ensure that we can collectively address any points of vulnerability, actual ones or potential ones in the future, together as peers, as has been said. So starting with the European Union, of course, we cannot and in all humility should not lecture anybody else unless we have our own house in order. We have taken several actions over the last few years with regard to cybersecurity. The EU cyber strategy does aim to improve security quite simply, uh, working with the engineering community and the other, other multi-stakeholders, particularly with regard to the root server system uh, in case of extreme scenarios. Uh, and let's face it, a few years ago, the global um, uh, environment was one that did give rise to some concerns uh, in that dimension, but also to increase and ensure the diversification of DNS resolution services, where we see that there is a dangerous trend towards market concentration. And that is something which I hope that African countries and the African Union working together can also address uh, because it is not just a concern here in Europe. And lastly, of course, our uh, security uh, strategy seeks to improve the, the deployment of, of internet security standards and their development. Um, and they are obviously crucial. But here again, they, that is a process which must be uh, global. It must be done by all partners, all regions. And we welcome and encourage the involvement of African countries and African stakeholders in that process. African stakeholders necessarily must take a very active part in this, de in this debate. Um, and so engagement with all levels of the community is very important, not just at the core in the technical areas such as in ICANN, but also in the standardization organizations as well. And here uh, Europe does have uh, certain measures to try and uh, um, assist other partners and other regions uh, in order to allow them to play their full part as equals, as has been said in, in these important processes. 
I would suggest also, uh, I mentioned our concerns about um, DNS resolution, but uh, that is something which Africa as a region uh, would probably also need to look at if it is the perception of African countries that there is a problem of concentration, that then perhaps we should be aiming for a situation in the future where the, an Africa-wide resolver as part of this decentralized um, uh, internet is something that is created. But we can, which can also then be geared to the needs uh, of growing African use and addressing local cyber threats um, as they develop. But I would just open the brackets here. This has been a theme of several sessions here in the IGF this week. We must, of course, as a global community, first and foremost, address the over 3 billion people who still do not have any basic access to internet. So clearly, as we seek to refine and secure those who are online, we must ensure that we ensure and allow the entire, the global population to have access to internet services, which are open, trusted, free, and of course, secure. So, so those are, are, are significant considerations for us. We hope to work together even though some people yawn and get very tired because we've been talking about it for 20 years, but with regard to the implementation of IPv6. And if, uh, if there is any, uh, shall we say, positive element to the uh, relatively um, uh, later development of uh, extensive internet infrastructures in Africa, it is that hopefully African countries can avoid making some of the mistakes that certainly we made here in Europe with regard to the resilience and robustness uh, of not just the core infrastructure, but also, of course, the security protocols that operate on that system. And if I could just finish by saying, again, inspired by the very insightful uh, contributions from the previous speakers, is that uh, uh, we are only recently really talking about cyber diplomacy. Uh, and Nena actually was the first to mention and differentiate slightly between digital diplomacy and cyber diplomacy. But I think it is very important, uh, as she said, but also as Vladimir then expanded on, that we don't see the two as being totally separate. Uh, as we develop cyber diplomacy, those diplomats, that, uh, that strand of discussions needs to be fully embedded and fully informed about the development of internet and ICT technologies in uh, general. Otherwise, we will give rise to not so much a tier, two-tier system, but a siloed set of discussions between those who are seeking to develop the internet technologies, including, may I say, many of the services which add value and can give rise to the uh, increased prosperity and increased well-being that Hakim uh, referred to, which is the goal of, that we all have. That will be happening on one side, and we will have a, a different approach to cyber uh, diplomacy, which will seek to, shall we say, set rules and be more prohibitive, perhaps. Um, and if governments are overly identified with just that strand uh, of the digital uh, ecosystem in which we are all operating, then that could have problems for all of us in Europe, in Africa, and globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Very informative uh, information. And uh, you mentioned uh, collaboration is key and it is important for the continent. And for our participants, just to let you know that uh, PRIDA is fully funded by the European Union. So there is a lot happening in that kind of cooperation. And uh, now we go to the next question that uh, is to Dr. Nena. Uh, Nena, what is the relevance of digital cooperation in? Uh, in digital governance strategies and policy making. And here we are saying at the continental level, we have the African digital transformation, we have the Africa continental free trade area, we have the African single market, even we have uh, African Union agenda 2063. Uh, what exactly is your take on that? Yeah, thank you, Margaret. And I'll start by saying that, you know, PS has absolutely underscored the value of digital cooperation and has spoken, you know, effectively as well to, to this question. So I absolutely agree that, you know, digital cooperation remains imperative because in the context of the borderless cyberspace, just as you mentioned, you know, collaborative approaches will engender shared responsibility among states. 
And that is why I would say that there is a growing need for multilateral cooperation, just the way Abdul Hakim has also mentioned, amidst, amidst the global pursuit for cybersecurity and cyber governance. Now, looking at this regional efforts, the value of digital cooperation for ensuring cyber trust and cyber security cannot be overemphasized. In as much as these are regional efforts, regional efforts alone will still be insufficient. Now, the UNGGE reports have consistently emphasized the increased need for international cooperation. If you look at the digital transformation strategy for Africa, you know, the 2020-2030 strategy, which of course speaks to the African digital transformation agenda, unequivocally states there that, you know, international cooperation, it states that collaborative ICT regulatory measures and tools are the new frontier for regulators and policymakers as they work towards maximizing the opportunities afforded by digital transformation. So which means that the African region, even in introducing these efforts, these strategies and policies are aware that collaboration is important. And we've said this again, Abdul Hakim has pointed out um, this fact that, you know, Africa remains weak when cybersecurity is measured. Now, if we look at all these efforts, the African digital transformation agenda, other continental efforts such as the African Continental Free Trade Area, the African Single Market, the AU Agenda, the 2063 Aspirations. These efforts will require effective cyber trust, security, and resilience, undeniably. However, when you think about all these efforts, you also think about the capability of Africa, which, you know, when you think about it, to effectively meet international standards of addressing cybersecurity, it calls into question, you know, the ability of Africa, the capability of Africa due to uncertainties concerning the effectiveness of sometimes existing cybersecurity mechanisms. So that notwithstanding, there have been efforts, you know, at ensuring cybersecurity, the European Union, um, PS has also mentioned that there have been cooperation efforts with the European Union and Council of Europe. One thing I wanted to highlight as well is, you know, the AU-EU ministerial meeting that happened in October 2021. If you also look at the joint communique, which was issued after that meeting in Kigali in 2021, it also underlined a commitment to digital cooperation between both regions. So we need digital cooperation, you know, not only for capacity building, we need it for policy exchange. We also need it for for you know, best practices, adopting best practices. We can learn in Africa that through digital cooperation, effective approaches to cyber governance can be achieved by developing transparent legislation, policies and strategies by building adequate cyber capacities and strengthening cooperation efforts, which would also include multi-stakeholder partnerships and ensuring appropriate cyber emergency response mechanism, which will be beneficial at the end to the goals that were set out for introducing these efforts that have been highlighted. But one thing I want to add before I end is that advancements in the area of international digital cooperation is laudable in as much as we are driving towards not being the weakest link, there are at least there are efforts being made there. However, what I think I also want to see beyond international cooperation is intra-digital cooperation in Africa, which is almost not happening. At the sub-regional level, it would be good to see, you know, ECOWAS cooperating with SADAC, you know, in terms of digital cooperation. It would also be good to see more intrastate or country cooperation, that in itself will enhance the desire for uniformity in cyber governance policies or cyber security policies, both in the development and pursuing of, you know, like the Malabo Convention, which was the first question you asked me. So when we look at uh, digital cooperation based on international cooperation, let's also look at it in terms of, you know, intra cooperation. I would just say that, you know, preserving cyber security or cyber stability in Africa must be a collaborative effort. And speaking to nation states, state actors in African countries must then devise cooperative mechanisms to observe and implement, you know, norms, strategies, and policies, and include them in their own cyber policy and strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Nena, that uh, digital cooperation, we need senior leadership, we need diplomas, we need everybody on board. And I come to you, uh, Hakim. Uh, African diplomats and senior leadership, including parliamentarians that are making the laws and the like, well informed on the role of cyber diplomacy in enriching their work in their respective mandates. Over to you, Hakim. Okay. Um, 
Thank you, Dr. Uh, Margaret. I, I, I would say the quick answer uh, is no, they are, in, they are not sufficiently well informed. Uh, first of all, let me, let me state that there seems to be a misperception uh, that cybersecurity, internet governance, artificial intelligence, uh, and by extension, uh, cyber diplomacy are not really Africa, African problems to solve. And this uh, misperception is compounded by the lack of awareness uh, you know, the inconsistent approach and certainly lack of consensus on issues surrounding things like cyber norms. Uh, secondly, um, I believe very strongly that we, we must encourage uh, research. And this is research that will support African parliamentarians and ultra high level strategic decision makers in drafting uh, appropriate interlinked and coherent policies, legislation, and regulations based on democratic values, because many of our nations are now endeavoring to build, you know, democratically driven societies. And those democratic values require, you know, the establishment of norms. And we really need to be able to leverage research that gives these ultra high strategic decision makers empirical evidence. Um, and part of the reason for this is that we do need to support them uh, to be able to avoid the negative impacts of uninformed decisions, uh, sometimes draconian legislation, and certainly, um, you know, misfocused policies and regulations that imp impinge on the development of our society uh, and certainly the development and, and well being of, 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 of our people. Because as we've seen in the world today, often local difficulties can trigger uh, global impacts. And you know, migration is just but one example. Uh, in addition, I think that we need to encourage the formation of some kind of uh, or a series of global coalitions of cyber professionals. Uh, and some kind of mentoring ecosystem to foster, you know, the development of consistent uh, cyber policies and norms adoptions. Um, I'm I'm very pleased to to note that this is something I observed the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise uh, is also taking up. And um, happily, I think uh, people like Nenna and myself at the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group are also part of this process of you know, developing these kind of uh, coalitions of cyber professionals. And really, uh, these coalitions need to be able to strengthen public-private uh, partnerships, reveal you know, new opportunities, certainly share intelligence and know-how, and build strong and coordinated response against cyber malfeasance, broadly speaking. Uh, another important lesson uh, for Africa is that we must first define our principles, ethics, and then our norms. Um, it is once we've defined our principle, ethics, and norms, then we need to be able to build on that to articulate the needed policy strategies and legislation to minimize the risk of being crushed, quite literally, between very powerful geopolitical camps. Uh, we saw how the Trump administration uh, tried to ban, not just ban the use of certain uh, 5G infrastructure, but basically bully other countries by telling them that if you put this manufact this uh, product on your network, your network can't interconnect with us. We've seen where <clears throat> Russia has experimented with disconnecting from the internet. We've seen where India uh, has banned 118, 118, uh, this was back in 2020, uh, apps, uh, you know, developed in China ostensibly because they violated uh, uh, national security uh, um, imperatives. And so <clears throat> Africa itself risks being caught out in these uh, geopolitical uh, tensions and, and, and activities. And so we do need to be able to not only empower ourselves, but more importantly, empower our parliamentarians and other ultra high level strategic decision makers about how 
geopol geopolitics actually impacts uh, technology. And then uh, in closing, I think it's very important that we establish uh, broad-based understandings. And we need to start quite simply with language, with jargon. We need to be able to look at issues such as culture uh, and gain insight into normative frameworks. And I think this is crucial because it ensures that um, we, we, we will need to work or we have to work towards requisite capacity building which would engender you know, some form of cyber stability. So again, uh, to summarize, there is a lot for us to do. Uh, our parliamentarians in particular, I think uh, need a lot of help um, uh, because I think, like I said, we've, we've not really appreciated that these things that are discussed and are decided in one area actually do have quite fundamental impacts on our society, on our competitiveness, uh, on, you know, on, our, on the, the ability of African nations to, to provide for the well-being of their people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hakim. Quite uh, uh, inspiring. You, you have uh, told us the different context, how we, as a continent, we have different values, we have different uh, context, and we need really to work on that, and we need to involve our parliamentarians in what we are doing. Now, coming back to you, Vlada, on the implementation, and as Hakim has said, Africa is diverse with different uh, digital development status. What are the potential challenges uh, in implementing the UN framework for responsible state behavior and confidence building measures in the cyberspace? Over to you, Vlada. Um, maybe maybe uh, clarify or remind what is the usual perception of discussions about this UN framework for responsible state behavior, uh, which relates directly to, to the processes like UN group of governmental experts, the open ended working group and so on. So uh, first of all, um, there is a perception that this is mainly the big, the big players game. Uh, and I think the UN Secretary General mentioned at some point two years ago, even that he's worried that the next war uh, will start with cyber, with cyber incident and so on. And we usually see it or worry what's in, 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 the, in the media um, framing, we are worrying about, you know, what's gonna happen between the US and China, US and Russia, the big guys. Uh, and to be honest, I, I don't think anything will actually come out of their cyber, um, I won't call it conflict, but provocations, because a much bigger stake is, is, is in the game. And if it happens, then we have a bigger problem. Uh, I think what Guterres was mentioning was actually related to areas in which we, we now have wars or which are either war-torn or tensed regions. And it's not just Africa, Middle East as well. It's, it used to be Balkans. So there, there are places around the world which, uh, where as we progress with digitalization, the risk of misusing cyber and turning it to, into open conflict is much higher than between the big parties. So that's the first thing that I think it seems far at the moment for Africa. And I hope it is far because I think Francilia also mentioned it in the chat um, and you mentioned the question, this sort of a lack of digitalization in African countries. And again, not just African countries where we say, well, most of our critical infrastructure is anyhow not yet connected to cyber. Yes, it will be if it is not yet. And it's increasingly, we are increasingly dependent. It's not just, you know, critical infrastructure is, has a much broader understanding today than just electricity. It's also financial sector, communications, all that. So it will come and we have seen some uh, teasing, if nothing, between already Egypt and Ethiopia over the Grand, Grand, Great Dam and, and other cases, even in Africa, even if they are not centrally guided by the, by the government. Now, that's one thing. The other thing, that's one perception it's, or misperception, it's about big players. It's not. The second one is that it's only about a conflict. And that, again, is not. Most of the things that are in the reports of the GGN Open Energy Working Group, yes, relate to international applicability of international law um, and these high-level politics and principles, how to avoid getting into conflict and how to behave if the conflict starts. Um, there are certain norms of what should and should not be done and so on. But in essence, 
this discussion on framework of responsible behavior sets the agenda, the global agenda. It, it builds the capacities. And I mentioned how many countries, African countries are getting into the process and newcomer, newcomers. It is a geopolitical positioning. I think uh, uh, Abdul Hakim mentioned it uh, in, a, in a previous address to what extent it's important that Africa is at the table as well. So it is, it goes much beyond conflict. And then it has a lot of provisions which are actually boosting political awareness on national levels of countries to do some very tangible measures to improve cybersecurity resilience. Now, there is a good question, how do we make sure that if we discussed in the previous part, how to strengthen diplomats to get involved in the processes, the good question is how to make sure we have a feedback loop, that we now, what we receive from diplomats actually ends where it has to end and boost the national processes as well. And that's an open question. I don't know how that can particularly be done. Uh, if we strengthen the ministries of foreign affairs and their departments, and if we strengthen the cooperation across the ministries uh, in charge of various aspects of cyber, and that's really broad, we might have this feedback loop. What are some of the very practical means when it comes to implementation of this framework, which goes beyond conflict? Certainly, there is this part of developing national positions on how international law applies. It is important because it's a matter of national security, national defense, and so on. It's about what do we, how do we understand the armed attack? How, we, how do we understand the attribution? How do we understand self-defense and the right to self-defense? And it's good if each country would come up with its own understanding of these terms and positions as it was invited, as, as countries were invited by the UN General Assembly to do. So we have a clear mandate for that. But then it's also boosting national regulatory framework and cooperation for resilience on a national level. And if you go to the report of the GGE of uh, 2021, this year, uh, you'll see a number of very practical, okay, principle level recommendations for national framework, which touch upon how to reduce vulnerabilities and uh, mitigate or, or prevent uh, commercial exploitation of vulnerabilities, how to strengthen supply chain security, uh, to build national or regional competences that, that, uh, that we mentioned. Then there is also um, what builds to what, what Pierce mentioned is the context of Africa or the role of Africa when it comes to international peace and security and the critical internet resources or what some would call public core of the internet and what formally we have in the UN documents is, uh, as a general availability or integrity of the internet. So what is the African role in maintaining this technical resilience of the whole core of the internet? And then lastly, the regional cooperation and boosting, I think uh, uh, Nenna also men mentioned that, where confidence building measures that are outlined in, as part of this framework are the key to prevent um, the conflict, but not only that, CBMs basically say or encourage states to share information about national frameworks, about uh, points of contact, share information about the attacks, uh, experiences, cooperate together. So it's really boosting the cooperation to uh, boost up the, the resilience. It's much more practical, or it could be termed much more practical than what it immediately looks like. And there is one suggestion. I don't know whether there is a potential for that. I throw it to all of you that are basically in Africa. Uh, I think uh, the ASEAN uh, countries uh, endorsed some of the CBMs by the group of governmental experts, even though it was already approved by the UN General Assembly, the whole report and all of the CBMs, it's a voluntary measure. So to boost the commitment, they just formally endorsed the CBMs and norms. I wonder whether African countries without reinventing the wheels and trying to combine at this point, their own CBMs, which is certainly welcomed, but maybe start with endorsing what we have and increasing the commitment of the on the national level for that and for implementation of those. I leave it as an open question. I leave it to, to you to maybe, maybe touch upon that. Back to you, Nicola. Thanks. Thank you, Vlada. Very informative. Again, uh, we come to Mr. Pierce. Uh, just to ask you to share with us uh, the ongoing initiatives by the European Union to promote cyber diplomacy in Africa. Over to you, please. 
Well, thank you. That sounds like a, an invitation for me to do a sort of a sales job on, uh, on, on, on European Union policies, uh, which I will try to avoid, but focus just on what I think is most important. I, I did mention the European Union cybersecurity strategy, and as an outward facing element of that in the context of what we're talking about today, we have launched a cyber diplomacy initiative, which we're calling Cyber Direct. And uh, that has the objective to contribute to the development of uh, a secure rights-based based, uh, international uh, cyber sphere, and also, of course, to support the principles of a single, open, free, stable, and secure cyberspace, which reflects, obviously, the values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Now, I spoke all those words slowly because it is not just um, uh, a set of principles that we can then move uh, on from. We are giving the training. Uh, like, I'm also Secretary General of Nepal Library Association also. So we are doing so many social works on that for using the internet to the ground suit level to uh, like all, like we are doing massive Sorry. things. And still, uh, I'm happy if uh, like uh, IBM will be uh, giving some um, I'm sorry, but we uh, seem to have a cross line uh, here. Uh, to collaboration with our Let Ministry of Education, uh, Nepal Library host, Association. Please, can you mute it will be Frank a, Anati? Uh, please mute Frank Anati. Sorry about that. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry too. Uh, okay, he's muted now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll try to be quick. Um, uh, there are there are key principles there, but, but these are elements that bring us together, for example, here in the IGF, which we must always maintain. But practically, we do want the uh, initiative to promote the UN framework for responsible state uh, behavior, which was referred to, including the application of existing law uh, norms, uh, and of course, uh, then confidence building measures uh, in the internet in order to ensure the stability in the cyberspace. And that we're doing with our regional partners, with the multi-stakeholder model, uh, and through multilateral engagements. And in doing that, we do want to build on work that's done, for example, the, the PRIDA uh, initiative itself. There are other areas where we can give practical and financial support uh, to experts, particularly in the context of sub-regional uh, initiatives, which are more appropriate and tailor-made to the needs, as Nana has explained, and where perhaps our best role can simply be to support that process and also to give where wanted and appropriate then uh, uh, learnings from how we have uh, taken certain steps within the European Union. But certainly it is to build consensus in partner countries between regions and sub-regions uh, for those principles of the open and secure internet. And it is perhaps in response to some of the issues which uh, Abdul Hakim referred to, where, where uh, major uh, international companies, but also some of the global superpowers have, have sought to uh, um, uh, exercise their muscles with regard to behavior in, in countries in Africa and elsewhere. Um, I hope that the European Union's behavior is not perceived in the same way. We do believe in building mutually uh, respectful uh, partnerships in this area, but quite genuinely, we are concerned and want to assist in maintaining the open access nature of the internet and ensuring that we do not have a system which is entirely state controlled. That also explains slightly why I said we need to not distinguish too much between cyber diplomacy and simply the discussions we have on the development of the digital environment so that we maintain the role for business, but also of course, particularly of NGOs, civil society and the multi-stakeholder community. We do have a program of action with regard to advancing responsibility and, and uh, responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And that uh, program of action uh, really does stem from the fact that we recognize that a concrete action and cooperation and support where wanted and appropriate, particularly capacity building is something where we can, um, uh, while working in a, a, a partnership of equals help uh, in the development of the open and secure internet in other countries while leaving it to the, the stakeholders and governments in those regions to actually give effect to that in a way that is most appropriate for uh, their um, uh, regional specificities and, and particular political culture. So uh, we, we, we do believe 
uh, extensively in capacity building. And I just then finish by saying on that point, therefore, that uh, in the context of the new uh, the newly launched Global Gateway, which was announced by our President von der Leyen. Uh, we will also be launching in 2022 an initiative to promote the open and free internet in Africa, working, of course, with African partners. The, 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 again, this is linked closely to our view that we need to, to assist in the uh, basic physical connection of uh, hundreds of millions of people to the internet to ensure that they too can benefit from, from open uh, access to, to, a, to, a, to a free and secure internet. And then building on that with regard to the, um, the need for cybersecurity to protect the user and the individual as well as the process in itself. And of course, to ensure that uh, we are um, developing together open standards uh, which are uh, applicable um, and acceptable to, to partners in other, in other regions, but which do follow the best practice with regard to security and other technical protocols across the internet. So that is something that we want to do together with our African partners in very concrete terms uh, and in support of the internet governance model, which is at the heart of what the IGF does and as we see where African stakeholders have so much to offer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pierce. Quite a lot of initiative going uh, in Africa. I'll now invite my colleague, uh, Adil, to take us through the questions in the Q&A and the chat. Thank you, and over to you, Adil. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nayambura. Um, my name is Adil Suleiman. I'm with the Senior Policy Officer with the, with the New York Commission. And I've been listening um, uh, pretty closely. I think it's very informative uh, session. And uh, we now open uh, the Q&A session. There are questions from the chat. Um, usually they are, uh, I think, uh, if I can say most of the questions are converging around um, whether Africa should take cybersecurity uh, as a priority. Uh, given the fact that uh, you know uh, it's uh, non-digitalized, non -digitalized. Uh, at this point, uh, no access and uh, also lagging behind in terms of technology. So I think let's keep that question and we'll, we go through the round uh, with all the uh, uh, panelists to respond to the question. Uh, basically, uh, whether Africa is ready for the cybersecurity. Uh, whether is Africa ready to include cybersecurity in its uh, its governance and its, in its policy? Uh, as I said, given the fact that there is an issue with the access, there is an issue also uh, in terms of priorities. Uh, I, I, let's open the floor uh, for those who are attending physically, and if there are questions, uh, let's hear them. Uh, 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 Mr. Sands, uh, you can uh, uh, facilitate that because you are there. Uh, uh, if there are questions on the, from the floor, uh, and we add them to the question that we already uh, got uh, on the chat line. Uh, it seems that there are no questions. Uh, okay, so I see one hand raised. Uh, so please go ahead and answer, uh, ask your question. Uh, hello to all. I am Fudestin P from uh, Liberia. Uh, I am the president of the Liberia Information and Technology Student Year and the first young mind to write book on cybersecurity in Liberia called Be a Good Digital Citizen. And I listened to that uh, splendid presentations. And I, I just wanted to ask this question to ladies that talk about uh, the Malabo Convention. My country, Liberia, having, uh, has seen some the, the Malabo Convention. So how is the, the AU or any organization working with my country to sign the Malabo Conventions? And also, my second question is, uh, I really want to ask as to how we can build or we can build a young cadre 
of uh, cyber diplomacy in Africa, because I do believe that uh, the issue of cyber security is not discussed on uh, the agenda uh, in various African countries. So uh, how can we uh, come up with a, a young uh, cyber security uh, diplomacy in Africa? So thank you so much. Any other questions? Follow the floor, please. Um, Ms. Chair and distinguished panelists, I am very thankful to you for this brilliant session and uh, remarks. For me, as a person coming from Persian Gulf subregion, it was very interesting to see that how we can use the lesson learned by Africans in our subregion. But um, uh, I think, uh, as well as said, nowadays cyber is not the subject of uh, diplomacy in Persian Gulf, but a source of conflict. My country, Iran, since 2011 is under attack, stock, stock sink attack, and you can see in 2017s that Qatar um, diplomatic crisis which was by, which was caused by a uh, cyber attack. Now, but it is very important that we ask, uh, do we have any uh, cyber regional uh, diplomacy model which is applicable in other regions uh, or uh, it is not possible and the regional dynamics effectively affects the content and priorities of um, cyber, cyber diplomacy in uh, different parts of the world. I think uh, uh, if we talk about the content of cyber diplomacy, we, uh, we have to pay attention to the priorities of a specific region. In our region, cyber geopolitics uh, and rivalries between great powers uh, is somehow affecting this cooperative move of diplomacy. And in this case, you are not talking about cooperative governance or cyber, uh, common cyber security, but um, more you are focusing on how you defend yourself and how you define your geopolitics in this competitive uh, atmosphere. And coming back to the Persian Gulf, in this case, you are not going to talk about uh, cyber uh, cooperative uh, and normative cyber diplomacy, but uh, you have more to focus on so, uh, somehow uh, principal pragmatism. It is very important that you come to prag uh, pragmatic results. Uh, coming back to the experiences uh, learned by European countries in 1960s or 1970s uh, based on no functional approach, it's very important that you, first of all, define pragmatic steps to have uh, tangible results and use these tangible results uh, as a spillover effects to come to another uh, area of cooperation. And uh, the last point is, what would be the international, the role of international brokers such as EU in other part of regions? Uh, as uh, I, I, I understand European countries in the form of EU have played uh, a role in uh, promotion of cyber uh, diplomacy in Africa. But can we define the same role for European Union in cyber diplomacy of Persian Gulf? I think in this case, it is very important that again, you take note of the priorities and dynamics of regional, uh, uh, of the region that you are living. And uh, um, I think uh, uh, it's not possible that you use a similar approach for different regions. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, any uh, other questions from the floor, please? I see none. So there are also a couple of questions from the chat. Uh, let me read. I believe that, uh, I hope that the panelists are taking note of the question. Uh, so uh, let me summarize one of the questions because it was, uh, uh, it was a long question, but uh, in a sense it says that, um, 
I believe uh, to reach cyber diplomacy, we need to have open and honest engagement in various cyber uh, space topic. Uh, already, I work in the topics that focus on human behavior, an element which is often overlooked, which I believe uh, is a critical cyber space discussion. And there is another question from Madagascar Hub. You um, uh, tell uh, no economy can work. Uh, if you can tell no economy can work if the cyber security does not exist. What are the situation of the country who does not have network or internet? Okay, so uh, let me just open the floor for the panelists to respond to the questions. And uh, let's start with Nena, uh, because I think there was a question on uh, Malabo Convention, and then we go to Abdul Hakim uh, and um, uh, Blada and, and uh, Mr. Sams. Thank you, thank you very much, Adil. And um, I'll speak to the question on the Malabo Convention first. And when I address the question on um, the Malabo Convention and the role of cyber diplomacy. One of the first things I did was to highlight the efforts of the African Union Commission in pushing forward for the ratification of the Malabo Convention, including the many workshops, um, you know, the confidence building measures, efforts to strengthen the cyber capacities of member states, and, you know, including what Abdul uh, Hakim has mentioned, the African Union Cyber Security Experts Group and efforts in that area. And, you know, one of the things that still makes you wonder is why the Malabo Convention is yet to receive the adequate ratifications needed for it to go into force with all these efforts. And we must remember, you know, like I also said, it, it, you know, these efforts are being done. Liberia is also, you know, one of the African states, of course, and no state is sidelined in all these efforts. But one thing we, we, we need to understand is that, which has also been emphasized um, by one of the contributions, that African states are all rooted in their respective cultural, historical, political context. And I agreed perfectly when Abdul Hakim said, you know, think about culture. Now, all this perspective impacts their ideologies. There are so many other factors, like I said, you know, um, there, are, you know, you have to think about how diplomatic efforts will also impact dialogues and negotiations for cybersecurity based on the capacities of countries. And that is why I said, when we have these discussions on digital cooperation, let's not just think of external, you know, international cooperation. You know, let's also think of intra-cooperation. Now, a country like Ghana, Ghana has ratified the Malabo Convention, ratified the Budapest Convention. It is also in the ECOWAS region with Liberia. You know, what efforts are also being made apart from the AUC, you know, what efforts are being made amongst countries which still sit at the same sub-regional table, you know, will Ghana also aid in, you know, saying to Liberia or to Nigeria, you know, we need these efforts to advance, you know, uniformity. And I also like that Pierce mentioned the Cyber Direct project, you know. The Cyber Direct Project, we had a meeting on Friday, AU-EU relations on Monday rather. And you see, they are interested in reaching African states. And you know, one of the issues that was tabled was to make sure that the usual suspects, you know, Ghana, most of the countries, that let's think about other countries that may actually be interested in furthering a cybersecurity agenda, but then there are no basis for them, you know, in terms of adopting best practices or knowing what to do. So the Cyber Direct Project is actually looking out to reach to African countries to collaborate in terms of advancing cybersecurity. And I think this is a good forum to highlight what Piers has said so that we can also um, take advantage of that. The last thing I wanted to touch upon was the question in relation to if we need cybersecurity. I was the one who mentioned that, you know, Africa remains the least digitalized region and that we must think about infrastructure. Now, based on that, that is the more reason why we need cybersecurity, you know, and we can't say in as much as we can't leapfrog into the stages of certain other regions, it doesn't mean that, you know, we do not need cybersecurity. And that is why, like I said, we must think about uniformity. Abdul Hakim said it, we must frame a cybersecurity agenda for, for Africa, thinking about our local realities. If we do not frame a uniform cybersecurity agenda, it will be framed for us. You know, so charity must begin at home. When we think about all the efforts that we are being that are being made, let's advance uniformity from there. Of course, it would also speak to cooperation outside, but let it be both ways and let, even when we engage in cyber diplomatic effort, let it also focus on developing strategies, policies in a uniform measure in Africa as well. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nena Abdel Hakim. Uh, thank you, Adil. Uh, first and foremost, let me start with the bottom line. And in my opinion, uh, the bottom line is that the global South, uh, Africa in particular, must develop its indigenous capacities based on teaching, learning, research, and innovation. It must build its people. Uh, with regards to the gentleman from Liberia, <clears throat> I would urge you to look back at your history. Once upon a time, Liberia was probably the most famous country for what is euphemistically called its flag of efficiency. Uh, some would say flag of convenience. And the question is how can we rebuild Liberia to have a digital preeminence? Liberia, I believe, has an opportunity, especially in Africa, to become a data hub uh, because of that history and understanding of how being a neutral country, uh, providing an efficient service in the case, in hi historically it was shipping, now it is in data. <clears throat> so it could be a data hub. I also uh, envisage a place like Liberia could uh, be one of the primary hosts for cybersecurity as a service. So a hub for cybersecurity as a service. And again, I think the key to all of this is that people like yourself in Liberia need to start building your capacity, not your personal capacity, but the capacity of people like you. Uh, with regards to our colleague uh, on the question of the Middle East, uh, I would really, uh, while I don't have a direct answer for him, I would really urge him to look at the OIC CERT, the OIC Computer Emergency Response Team. I believe it's one of the few entities in, around the world where both Iran and Saudi Arabia actually sit at the same technical table. And so while it is not a cyber diplomacy table, in life, sometimes you need to start somewhere. And so that you, you, you know, sometimes it is um, the technical imperatives that may subsequently drive, uh, you know, other, uh, other national uh, and strategic Im imperatives. Now, building on the question from uh, Francilla, um, I understand she comes from a hub in Madagascar. And I, I'm a bit puzzled because uh, if you are part of a hub, then obviously it means Madagascar does have some connectivity. Um, I would suppose, uh, I don't know, uh, Madagascar at least has GSM networks, maybe even um, 4G. And, Insofar as there's some kind of communication, whether it's SMS or email or other, other kinds of IP connectivity, then it means that you do need some level of cybersecurity. And, but more importantly, uh, Frances, Francilia, sorry, and others, we have to understand that all societies, all organizations, and all economies require trust to optimally function. No one will use any structure without trust. Even today, if, 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 if I don't trust this uh, uh, connectivity, if I think it's going to download something that will steal my banking details, I simply will not use it. And digital trust is predicated on confidentiality, integrity, and availability as appropriate of information that is based on accurate data, which as we all know is increasingly being digitized. So I would argue that cybersecurity really is the foundation for building trust in a digital society, indeed in building trust in a con contemporary society. And let me close with the following uh, three key takeaways for me. Again, trust is key. Without trust, no one will use the platforms. Confidence building measures arising from cyber diplomacy are extremely helpful in developing trust by facilitating and achieving some level of predictability, by empowering people to seek clarification, by ensuring that sometimes things that move at a very rapid pace, you can gain time so that you can step back and rethink certain things. But very importantly, I think cyber diplomacy helps in creating understanding and enhancing maturity. Uh, takeaway number two for me is that Africa must articulate its philosophy 
ethics policy strategies and accountability frameworks across the spectrum, including uh, and in, in many instances driven by cyber diplomacy. And last but not least, uh, I urge all of us in the audience and even those you interact with, please, please, please always factor the underserved, the unserved and unborn in your policy strategy, cyber diplomacy and norms development and implementation activities. Because back to the 1880s, the Berlin Conference, back to the development of norms, those who are not at the table, the underserved, the unserved, and the unborn must live in the future with the decisions that we make today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Abdul Hakim, for the uh, uh, informative and, 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 and uh, informative uh, conclusion. We left with two minutes. Uh, so, um, Lada and Piers, uh, you know, we give you uh, maybe one and a half minutes each, one and a half minute each. We will stay as long as the Secretariat will allow us to stay. So Vlada, uh, please, and then Chris, you can conclude. And if Vlada, if you have uh, parting uh, messages, please uh, go ahead and include your messages uh, uh, as well as for Piers. Thanks, Adil. You know, I, I was never good with tweets, but I'll try to do that. On uh, Abdul Rahman's question on connecting uh, digital with cyber in a way, I think this is something we covered through this session. There general, um, there's a general evolution in, the, in understanding how digital uh, impacts sustainable development goals, economics, trades, and so on. The problem is how do you put all these different international processes together, like WTO, UN security, uh, issues and so on and so forth. Maybe the UN Digital Cooperation uh, proposal by the UN Secretary General, the IGF definitely, maybe the IGF plus in future, will actually serve well to connect these dots. Let's stay tuned. Um, when it comes to Madagascar's questions, I agree with uh, Abdul Hakim. Uh, I, I managed to Google quickly, so there is certain about 15% of penetration in, in Madagascar. The point is, regardless of citizens, the state and the institutions will get and the businesses will get connected at an increasing rate. But your question, what will happen if cybersecurity doesn't exist, is a masterpiece of a question to tell to policymakers for a buy-in and try to find the response. Within PREDA work, GFC work, we try to do that. So let's try to channel policymakers into these processes. Liberia's question uh, was uh, how to build young cybersecurity diplomacy officially. It takes a buy-in on a high level. But it also takes, if you find a pioneer on a mid-level in institutions to use opportunities to train people to engage and so on. We have some good experiences in Balkans. I'm happy to share them. And officially, and that's important, diplomats are not just, I mean, cyber diplomats are not just diplomats, back to that. And in Liberia, I remember I participated in uh, ISOC Liberia discussions within ISOC, trying to boost cyber diplomacy and cybersecurity among others, technical community and so on. So that's another opportunity. And finally, on Iran's question, uh, or, or uh, the, the, the Gulf, I think this is a really relevant question, how to, what are the basic building blocks that can be used everywhere around the world? And I would say it is understanding the importance of digital foreign policy, building resources, capacity building and all of that, and map the open questions. That's common for everywhere. The next step, once you have that, is decide on priorities, positions, and methodology of your digital foreign policy, engagement, and so on. That differs from state to state. So I guess the first step is same everywhere. And as you said, for a few messages, um, a buy-in at the highest level, developing resources among diplomats and other stakeholders, making sure that we use the capacity of non-states, which are great in, in developing countries, uh, and uh, and I would certainly underline capacity building and stop there. It was more than a minute and a half. I apologize. No problem. Pierce, please. Uh, uh, sorry to put you on this difficult spot, but uh, I no, think you, I are, you are up to it. Well, I, particularly as I wanted to hear everyone else as well uh, with their valuable contributions. Thank you. So I'll be very quick. First of all, on cybersecurity itself. Yes, you have to work with and build from what we call cybersecurity by design from the start. I think it's worth recalling, even though we're talking about uh, diplomacy and there's a certain suggestion that we're mostly talking about state actors, um, uh, in terms of quantity, at least, uh, the vast majority of cybersecurity threats 
and actual cybersecurity penetrations, uh, incidents in other words, come from uh, commercially motivated actors who seek to, to steal and defraud. Uh, and uh, in a, an internet environment, which is just, shall we say, uh, in its infancy or growing, particularly with a large, we hope, a large, very large number of new users of the internet, where perhaps the uh, digital literacy is not at a very high level, that is when those users need to be most protected from those bad actors. So cybersecurity from the start. And then on the role of the European Union, particularly the example of the Middle East, yes, perhaps we have to be careful and not naive. Uh, we see the great cooperation at the level of the African Union uh, and the ability of that region and sub-regions to work together. But in areas where there are clear geopolitical tensions, we still have to hope, and I think Abdul uh, Hakim's answer was very good, and Nena also, in the sense that um, uh, this is an area where people have an interest to work together. Again, it's not just the diplomats, it's the engineers, the stakeholder community who can actually build links, which might actually have uh, a positive effect beyond simply building the internet. But it is a model where Obviously, as I said, the European Union wishes to support and give our best practice, but again, it is uh, for a community of equals who can take the learnings that are relevant to them, uh, who can benefit from some of the uh, project support that we give in order to adapt and apply the model as is most appropriate for the region or for the sub-region. Thank you very much.